Hey friends, this is Scott. I want you to know how much I appreciate you as listeners, and I hope you appreciate my sponsors because they make this show possible. Raygun provides full-stack error, crash, and performance monitoring for tech teams. Whether you're a software engineer looking to diagnose and resolve issues with greater speed and accuracy, or a product manager drowning in bug reports, or maybe you're just concerned you're losing customers to poor quality online experiences, Raygun can provide you with the answers. Get full-stack error and performance monitoring in one place. The next time you're struggling to replicate errors and performance issues in your code base, think Raygun. Head over to raygun.com, that's R-A-Y-G-U-N.com, and get up and running within minutes and dramatically improve your online experiences of your users. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and today I'm talking with Laura Frank. She is the Director of Engineering at CloudBees. How are you? Hey, Scott. I'm doing really well. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm excited to talk to you because you have expertise in containers that goes back kind of to the beginning. Like, were you there when Docker was brought out, announced? To the days of your... Um Yeah, I started using Docker in 2013, which is... It really was just like a couple months after Solomon made the, I guess, announcement or shared the project at PyCon during that like very famous lightning talk, the most famous lightning mm-hmm. talk that ever was. Um, so I remember very distinctly, I was wor- working at HP at the time, working on HP Cloud, back when they had HP Cloud, Public Cloud, and someone mm-hmm. shared the link of the talk in our IRC channel and thought like, oh, this, this thing sounds pretty cool. And I was like, it does sound pretty cool. And from there, you know, X, X, Y, Z happened. We had a, a mutual colleague that ended up going to CenturyLink to, to start a team in the labs department to do research and development. The topic was Docker and like a, a bunch of us from, from HP went over there to start working on developer tools. So it happened really, really quick. Um, but yeah, I've been very, I've been steeped in the container world since, since about 2013. Is that one of those things where you see a technology, you hear about a new project, and you're like, oh, yeah, I, I need to be all over that. And then you just jump in? Or were you already in, in satellite projects or things in the area around it? Yeah, I was in the developer tool space. Um, I was working on the infrastructure team at HP Cloud. So I was very much into um, the you know cloud migration story, tools that made it easier for developers to start um, doing work in the cloud, things that made developers more productive. So I was in sort of a adjacent space. Mm-hmm. The one interesting thing about me though, is that I'm really boring and I, I don't, I don't love risks. <laughs> um, I, I grew up in the Midwest. Uh, my dad's a mechanic. Um, you know, financial stability wasn't, wasn't really something that I, I had a lot of when I was and not not necessarily not when I was young, but when I was in college, like putting myself through school, the, the idea of joining a startup or working on a very early project with a lot of risk involved is just not my cup of tea. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't know, there was something, something about it that made me feel very confident and safe about the future. Um, so I just, I just kind of went with it. I really trusted my colleagues as well. And I knew that um, that we could build something um, cool with the project, and, and we ended up doing um, quite a bit of cool stuff. And I'm still here, so yeah, it sounds like it's a big bet, but it's a bet that paid off. It did, yeah. I wish I could, you know, that question like if you could tell your past self something, I would be like, listen, it's going to be fine. Um, it's mm-hmm. gonna be fine. And are you you're still a member of the Moby Projects Technical Steering Committee? I am. I've been, um, I was elected, I think this was probably about a year ago that elections were, and it's a two, a two year term. So I'm, I'm happily sitting on the technical steering committee for Moby project. I am a member of the Docker captains group. So this is a group that this dates all the way back to 2015. I think we were, um, kind of formally announced at DockerCon EU in Barcelona, which DockerCon mm-hmm. EU will be in Barcelona this year again, which is pretty cool. Um, it was sort of an aggregate group of people who were doing a lot of blogging, speaking, community organizing, um, people who had sort of stepped stepped up and um, had a bit of a loud voice around um, 
Docker, using Docker, or different things you could do with Docker. So um, I'm really happy to be part of that group as well. And the the people that I've been able to meet or help get started with containers has been really rewarding there. Could you detangle the names a little bit for a second? Like it, when I see the Docker icon, it's a it's like a it's a whale, yeah. it's a whale right? So that, is that Moby <laughs> yeah. Dick? Is That's that meant to imply it's like Moby, but he's got containers on his back, so he's like a ship. Yeah, he's so that's Moby. His his name is not Moby Dick. It's Moby Doc. Um, Moby Doc. Yeah, that's actually awesome. I did not he know that. He has um, a counterpart as well. I can't decide if it's a wife or a sister, or maybe just a coincidence that they have the same last name. But her name is Molly Doc. And what is okay? Is this is yeah. a, this is like for another project? Um, she's just, she's just there. I think I'm not sure if people who, (laughs) anyone who is not like really, really deep into the Docker world or hasn't attended a Docker con knows, um, I see. I think, I think Moby just like being blue and like being, I think he's just like very (laughs) cool boy. Um, so no, so it's nice. Like, it's nice to have a, a girl whale as well, but. Okay. So the Moby project is like. What's the difference between Moby and Docker, though? Like Chrome yeah. is to Chromium as Docker is to Moby? I'm so glad you asked. So this was um, this was announced in Austin, the the foundation of the Moby project. And it I think it just wasn't announced very well. And there were lots of cleanup tasks, I should say, like PR tasks afterward to kind of detangle it. So I'm glad we can talk about it here. So Docker mm-hmm. Inc. is a corporation that sells Docker the product. And then okay. for a long time, there was github.com slash Docker. And Docker was the open source project behind the product that Docker Inc. sold. So there was mm. just this natural cla- like um, clashing interests, I guess, because the open source, you know, let's say, for example, Microsoft is a huge contributor to the Docker, old, the, the days of your Docker open source project, which they were. Okay. Um, like maybe Microsoft wants to productize some of it and like then they're pushing or even Docker Inc. wants to, you know, they're productizing it and then they push stuff into the open source project. So it's just a conflict of interest to solve that problem and to make it really clear that Docker Inc. is a company with corporate interests and that there are open source components that are kind of going into um, going into the product. Everything that's open source and that's like a builder or plumber component is now in the Moby project. Um, that stuff like container D, the runtime, um, all of those low level components to, um, that are kind of consumed by the upstream or I guess downstream Docker product. So, okay. So let me see if I understand this then. So, so Moby has this library of backend components, like all the different, like backend containerized stuff, networking and volume management and logging and stuff. And then there's a framework to assemble all of that and deploy and test those artifacts. Yep. And all of that, the, the collision of those things are Docker. Okay. Could I go and take Moby and turn it into like Scott Docker and sell yeah. it? Totally. If I, if I was clever. Yeah. You to- if you had a bunch of time on your hands and <laughs> <laughs> a couple of Red Bulls, you, you totally could. So it's just um, a matter of code. It's just a. It's just a matter. Of, it's typing. It's all it is. It's just if you have it's enough true. time to type it out, then then you can. Have I should it. tell my. I should tell my kids that I'm like I want to be a programmer. It's just typing. It's not it's a big typing. deal. Yeah. Okay. So then, what is Linux Kit? Yeah, Linux Kit is really interesting project. Um, so Linux Kit is like I'm trying to think of how I can explain this. Um, it's sort of like making your own operating system or making your own distribution of Linux, but like all in mm-hmm. containers. Well, so the reason I, the reason I ask is that there's all these Linuxes, right? And like I'm running Windows 10, but I've got like four Linuxes that I run on it. And, you know, every once in a while I'll call some native API and I'll get like, oh, you're missing lib, blah, blah, blah. You know, you dummy. Go get lib, blah, blah, blah. And then it's a whole thing. And there's this whole dance of like, does my app support the APIs at the native level that I, that my app needs. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I'll go and put together a Docker container for my app and it'd be like, Oh, it's 800 megs. You're an idiot. And then I'll do it again. And it's like, Oh, it's 40 megs. You're a genius. And I have no idea 
like what happened. And I really just want to know how do I ship the smallest Linux that does just the functions of my app calls? Yeah. Linux gets a great project to, to peer into, um, to, to solve okay. that specific problem. So the, the kind of premise and I guess the, like the tagline kind of description for Linux kit is you basically building your own distro of Linux specifically for mm-hmm. whatever workload that you're going to run on top of it. So, um, I think that's been a, oh. a general struggle in the container world and, and kind of, there's like, you know, on one end containers are really appealing to people because, there's this promise of like, cut out all the fat, only have what you need to run your application. Dependency management is great. Everything is super tiny. Um, there's, you know, optimization of images, optimize your Docker file, optimize everything so that it's the smallest, small, small thing. Um, on the other hand, there's like developer productivity and wanting to make kind of like the silver bullet image that will do pretty much anything that the consumer, the developer on the other end wants to do, there's really not a way to make those types of images super, super tiny and strip away everything because you never, you can't really predict the use case of whoever might be consuming it. Yeah. Um, so for, yeah. for those people that are really concerned about running the absolute smallest thing, um, getting really, really deep down into the plumbing stuff, um, that's what Lin- Linux Kit is a project for you. If you're interested in running containers as a maybe as a developer use case or um, just like to help you in your daily work or even if you're running them in, in production, um, it might not be. I think it's a cool project to look into, but it might not be like immediately actionable for for that particular use case. OK, so I'm hearing that, you know, if my app works great on Ubuntu or on Alpine and, you know, I don't have the patience or the interest to go and dig into Linux kit that's okay. Like I shouldn't feel bad. Yeah. You shouldn't feel bad. I think, you know, even in, in my circle and I'm pretty into the, like the container power user, I only know personally a handful of people that um, even experiment with Linux kit. And I don't mean to, to make it sound like not approachable, but it is like a, it's a building block and kind of like a underground plumbing sort of tool. It's not, um, mm. it's, I think there's a very small, subset of developers that are working on problems that are well solved by Linux Git. I think Docker, the people who work at Docker um, are great examples of those kinds of people working in that space. Um, But for a lot of us, even when I was, um, I'm now at director level, don't code day to day necessarily anymore. Um, But even when I was Mm -hmm. coding a lot, um, using Docker a lot, I, I probably wouldn't have touched Linux Git very frequently. Um, and, and okay. Well, it's good to know that it exists. And maybe if I were an engineering person at Netflix, I'd make like Netflix OS and it would be like just the perfect little Linux for Netflix and we'd all use it. But the average Joe and Jane do not need to worry about that. So that's good to know. Yeah. My, my, fi- my final thought about Moby Project and like these plumber components, I think it's easy if you are a developer, like getting started with Docker, or maybe you're even using it every day and you see all these like really cool projects coming out of Moby, like build kit, Linux kit, info kit. And, and it can kind of cause you shame maybe to think like, Oh, I'm not using them. Am I not like, am I not smart or, you know, what's, is this for me? Is this not for me? Am I not a great developer? Like, no, you're, you're great. Um, these are really low level components <laughs> and they're not, um, don't feel bad if it's not something that you're touching every day, like you're doing fine. Yeah. Well, I think we, we appreciate that because there's a lot of, there's a lot of words and there's a lot of nouns that are being turned into project names. And if you hear about a noun and you're like, Oh no, I have to learn that noun now too. I just learned this other noun. Yeah, it can be a little bit overwhelming. It's so hard to know what to pay attention to. I think in this, particularly in this space, like the cloud native space, the container space, it's like. You know, I think JavaScript has a bad reputation of, you know, there's something shiny every day. Um, That's like, I think, a bit unfair because there's lots of that happens everywhere, regardless of um, what language or what what how deep in the stack you are. So it's certainly happening in the container space. um, Super low level. There's often a bunch of new shiny stuff all the time. It's easy to get distracted or not quite know where to focus. Mm -hmm. So Docker was released for the first time, like you said, in March of 2013. So even though it took over the world, it's only five years old. Yeah, it's a baby. Which is crazy. 
No. It's a baby. Yeah, exactly. Like my, you know, I've got, I had a five-year-old and, you know, his whole brain wasn't even attached to the rest of his body. Even now he's 12 and he's still like marginally it's, functional. It's still not attached. <laughs> still not attached. It'll take just a couple of years. When he's, yeah. When he's in his twenties. No. Um, so, but you, you, the way people talk about Docker, you would think it like invented the container. Yeah, totally. Like as a concept. Did not. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, um, <laughs> I, I think back to one of the first talks that I gave, um, or maybe even like the first large conference talk that I gave was um, RubyConf 2014 about mm-hmm. using like how to develop a Rails application in Docker or with Docker. And my first slide, or maybe my second slide after the like, hi, my name's Laura slide was doc- a Docker is not a container. And Docker didn't invent containers. They never, ha- you know, it, they'll the narrative might change, but they still won't have invented containers. Containers have been around components of containerization have been around and um, for decades really. And they're just sort of making it really easy to use as a developer. And I think even now, you know, five years and that I think that point still gets, gets missed, especially if people who are, are joining the conversation now and, and have missed that historical context. So um, I'm always happy to talk and kind of explain the the history. Well, so Docker is five years old, but Linux containers came out like nine years ago. But OpenVZ came, which was a virtualization technology for Linux, was like 13 years ago. Like, but all of this is still even older than that. Yeah, yeah. The it's always the same stuff, kind of repackaged and, and repurposed. And I think um, containerization and, and what we call a container is sort of the culmination of quite a few principles or a few patterns that have existed in computing for a long time. Maybe they haven't been super widespread or very well supported. Um, things like C groups made things a lot easier, namespaces, et cetera. Um, those like very building blocks of containers, um, they often go kind of under the radar because they're wrapped in this nice like whale, blue whale that is, is easy to interact with. And it's really e- easy to focus on the blue whale. And, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm using Docker every day, if I understand like what happened 15 years ago or, or how containers were, had evolved over time. Um, I think, and that's fine. I think it's, um, I think it's always interesting though, to kind of look back and see the patterns that tend to repeat themselves over time. Um, I'm mm-hmm. very interested in those. So. Hey, friends, this is Scott. You know, listening to podcasts is a great way to keep up to date on technology since we're always learning as software people. And you can also find a job by listening to a podcast. If you check out our new sponsor, Hired.com, that's H-I-R-E-D.com slash Hansel Minutes. On Hired.com, software engineers can get interview requests from companies that want to hire you. Each offer will have the salary and the equity up front. You can view those interview requests and, you know, accept, reject, change the offer before even talking to a company. It's a great way to find out what's out there and maybe make a move. Uh, They're working with over 6,000 companies from startups to large companies from 14 major tech hubs throughout North America and Europe. What's great about this is it's totally free for software engineers. And if you get a job through Hire.com, they'll ordinarily give you a $300 thank you bonus. But if you use our special link, they'll double that bonus. So you will actually get paid $600 when you accept that job. Now, if you're not looking for a job, but you know someone who is, refer them to Hire.com slash Hansel Minutes, and they'll give you a lead bonus, a $1,337 bonus when they accept a job. So check them out at Hired.com slash Hansel Minutes. So for someone who's trying to find that balance between what we just talked about, which is uh, you don't have to learn everything, and here's a whole list of words, and now you can forget all of those and just use Docker. And on the other hand, though, all the cool historical context and the where containers came from as a concept, et cetera, et cetera, where do you decide when to stop? If, if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, wow, they're halfway through, and I'm still not sure if I'm supposed to use Docker or not, what do we tell them? If you've never used a container before, don't get bogged down with all of the historical context. It's like, if you think that you might be interested in cake, I wouldn't recommend that you go to the store and like look at the history of flour and think about all the different kinds of sugar that you want. I would just recommend going to the bakery and picking out something that looks good and trying it first. Um, then when you want to make changes to maybe like, oh, maybe that's a buttercream I don't really care for and I want to have Italian buttercream instead, 
then I think that's the time to to dig a bit deeper, uh, a little bit underneath the surface. But if you're happy with that cupcake, then and it's working for you, like we're all humans. We have only we have limited time. We have limited keystrokes. There's um, probably something else that you could you could do um, if it's not interesting to you. Don't feel pressured to to dig into the nitty gritty details. Mm-hmm. So what's all this talk of container wars, though? Like, did is is there a war? Did we win? <laughs> uh, am I, you- <laughs> I am unsure. I think we won. Um, I could be wrong. Who are we? I don't feel like I lost. I think that's good. So I think there. Um, so maybe here here's a little bit of history lesson. So Docker is, I would say, the market leader or like market share leader for sure on containers, and I think that's they're not the only container runtime. I think right now it's a, a solid container product. And that's a, maybe an important distinction is like Docker Inc. is a corporation that has a product and that product is Docker. There's a lot of internal stuff like the container runtime that goes into Docker, but there are other container runtimes out there. And um, I think this must have been two or three years ago, but CoreOS, um, and it still exists today, but CoreOS came out with Rocket, RKT, unsure what the correct pronunciation is. And I think I've never asked, so I'll just keep, keep saying rocket. Uh, maybe it's Urkit. I don't know. Um, but they, they came up with their container runtime to sort of not, I wouldn't say compete with Docker maybe in, in some ways, but to sort of, um, complete the story perhaps, or just offer an alternative. So, Mm -hmm. um, that was sort of the start of this, like, Oh, you know, I feel like there's, there's like militant, forking on github of like we're forking this repo and like we're gonna build something else and in a lot of ways rocket felt like that it was like oh wow you know everyone the community had really gotten behind docker and then now there's this thing that's like causing some some turbulence in the container space so that's sort of where we started with the container wars and i think now when we look at the the landscape around us, it's really clear that we've ev- we've evolved to the orchestration wars, mm-hmm. and that's where most people spend their energy. Is did Kubernetes win? Warring swarm. Like who's the winner? Yeah. And I just think okay. So let me yeah. see if I understand this then. So CoreOS is this lightweight distro built around containers yeah. that was done by the CoreOS folks, and they did a they did Rocket built on top of RKT or Rocket. Yeah. Uh, but this is all sitting on Linux containers, though, right? You need C groups and you need all the Linux stuff anyway, right? So this is just like not to be, I, I use this analogy a lot. There's a whole, you know, VHS versus Betamax. Mm-hmm. Like it's still a cassette tape, it's got like a magnetic spool inside. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not fundamentally different. They're not fundamentally different. I think there's like some distinctions. And I actually, you know, it's so funny. Like this. This, this rocket versus Docker, I think it took up so much of my like bandwidth at that time. It, you know, it was like the most important thing. And I'm thinking back right now and I think, wow, what even were we so mad about? <laughs> I, can't, I can't even particularly remember the, the specifics. But, mm. um, but yeah, so Docker used to be based on Linux containers, LXC. Um, if so, mm-hmm. if you haven't heard the term LXC, that's like the the Linux container and Docker just built on top of LXC and, and used the, their basic functionality of containers and added some stuff on top of it. And it was like, okay, we're, Mm -hmm. we're putting the nice, like the frosting on it and, and making it easier for developers to use. Um, But you're right. A lot of the stuff like at the LXC level was shared. It was a couple, I would say two years after Docker started that they actually got rid of LXC and they started running on their own runtime. Um, so that was also, is that lib container? Yeah. Yeah. So that's like when we talk about the container wars, a lot of what that, you know, what that actually means. It's not like Docker necessarily. It's like the container runtime wars. Like is it Mm. LXC versus lib container and like what container runtime are, are we using? Um, but what's interesting, and I think when we did beyond containers, uh, with Tracy a, a couple months back, we touched on this as well about how, you know, things that we interact with often and that seem to be the most important thing. It's like just give it maybe six months or a year and, and that little piece of tech mm-hmm. becomes abstracted away from us. And I think that's really what happens. Like no one thinks about if they start up a container, what runtime it's using or like if it's using LXC or something else, what you're 
focused on. Yeah, I just need that. it to work. Yeah. And I need to, well, because we're perfect. betting our companies on this technology, yeah. right? I just want it to work. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and we've seen that. I mean, we've seen that commoditization, not, and it's not just in tech, it's like everything. I mean, when you buy an EC2 instance on AWS, like you're getting electricity, but you don't, you don't think about like, oh, I have to pay the electric bill for the data center. Um, electricity is a commodity and it just like, it comes with it. When you, mm-hmm. um, when you pay for a, you know, can, I don't know run, if you run a container on AWS or if you're using a hosted um, or managed orchestration service, you're getting a container on time that's packaged in it. You just don't necessarily see it or think about it. Um, hmm. So I think. So, sorry. Help me understand though. Move it up. Move it up to orchestration though. Then are we going to not think about that? Like, will I? Is there a world where I don't even think that Kubernetes exists? I think so. Um, and I think that world is. I think that's. <laughs> I think the natural progression is maybe a bit paused because we are, as an industry, just like so captivated by Kubernetes and we think it's the most amazing thing ever and can't imagine our lives without it. Um, so I think that's going to, it's stalling a bit, the, the commoditization, but I think we're, I think we're going to get there where if you're, what you really want is you want an application that's running, that's distributed and highly available. Like that's the thing that we're going after here. So whether that's Kubernetes or like something else, it, as a developer, it's probably not the most relevant thing to you. Um, if you are, of course, like a reliability engineer or someone who's on call or supporting these systems, like then, then the question's a little bit different and maybe it is more important. But um, I think it will be a year um, until we have other patterns that sort of wrap Kubernetes and maybe abstract um, Kubernetes away. I think people will start thinking about like, I don't think people will be talking about pods or, you know, parts of the Kubernetes syntax, like their, their YAML declarations, deployment declarations necessarily anymore. I think it's going to be a, maybe one level up, like just generally here's my application. And then there needs to be some service that takes that application and says, okay, well, I'm going to translate it into this thing so it can run on Kubernetes, but it could run somewhere else. Um, Well, now you've got, and then you've got Istio, to sit on top of Kubernetes, mm-hmm. to connect microservices. I f- I, are we just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic and we're just going to go and squish it all together? And like someone's going to write some thing that takes Istio plus Kubernetes plus Docker and turns it all into a, a monolith again? Yeah, I, I'm wait. I'm ready. I'm ready for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, like how, how distributed does this thing have to get before? It's just like, oh, come on. Can we just write like a big old C application? Yeah, you know what's so interesting? Um and I guess this is not totally related to to microservices and containers, but um, you know I work in a the CI/CD world, so I'm really interested in automation. I see a lot of uh, companies source like I don't see their source code specifically, but I see how they organize it. And the Mono mm-hmm. repo is getting a lot of traction now. Um, so if if you've not heard the term before. So we have we have microservices, which is this architectural abstraction of putting you know business logic in little chunks and making them you know available via API and having all these little services. Um, and usually it's that one service corresponds to one repo on GitHub or whatever your SCM provider is. But it's really hard then when you're trying to automate and actually like run stuff in production to have like a hundred repos in your um, your source code management tool. So what a lot of companies have done and actually some, some quite prominent ones are, they just like said, no, everything's just in a folder. It's just in one repo. Um, so now we're, <laughs> we're seeing like, I mean, everything's a pendulum. We swing one way and then, you know, it's like, Oh, we gotta, gotta start swinging the other way. But I'm definitely seeing some movement in that, that other direction. Um, we're seeing the, you know, monolith first, um, the monolith first first method that Martin Fowler wrote about. Um, I think it's not even really that recent. I think it was like a year ago when he he wrote that blog post that I I find to be very captivating, and I share it often with people who are um, struggling with microservices. But um, I think you know this. I think there's this this representation of the world where everyone's using containers and everyone has everything in microservices and everyone's using Kubernetes. And if you're not doing it, you're too late. 
I think that's just really not accurate. Um, and if you're listening to this podcast and you're not using containers and you feel bad about it, please don't. I care about you. Um, I don't think that you're doing anything wrong. Don't feel bad. Um, I think in reality, it's it's something I think the last statistic I read, uh, and I can't remember the source of it. I'll, I'll rock my brain trying to find it. It was something like 10% of developers or IT professionals are actually using containers in production. I think that's really different from the story mm. that, that we're told um, or the perception maybe. I appreciate that because it's overwhelming, it right? Is. Like even just now yeah. people are listening and they're like, okay, Docker, Kubernetes sits on top of that. Istio sits on top of that. And then Istio uses Envoy and Mixer and Pilot and Citadel. And it's just like now, 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 now. Yeah. I just want to make, hello world scale, you know, mm-hmm. that's, that's all I really wanted to do, you know, but now I've got containerized distributed hello world. And then while we are recording this uh, podcast, I don't know if you know about this, but Google cloud just announced K native like 20 minutes ago, which is serverless Google cloud on top of Kubernetes on Google cloud. That's like they're announcing it. They're in the process yeah. of announcing it like this moment, you know, and again, serverless then, What's so funny about serverless is it aims to hide it all. Yeah. Right? Like, that's the whole idea of serverless is like, build all this stuff, all these nouns, and now we're going to hide everything and pretend it doesn't exist. And we're going to put a slider bar in front of it. And then we're going to attach that slider bar to your credit card. And that's serverless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's wild. It, it is. I mean, there's a new shiny object every day, I feel. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, your point, your point, I think, is is super, really solid. It's, it's that it's, it's overwhelming. And now we're just, we're combining a bunch of stuff together and it's really hard to know what to pay attention to what's going to stick. Like is, yeah, is serverless going to stick? It, are containers going to stick? I think the answer we've, we found to be yes, but like, but maybe no, because you know, you, if you're using a serverless architecture, some serverless service, serverless as a service, um, or functions as a service, I guess is a good way to talk about it. It could be running on Kubernetes. Mm-hmm. Like it could be running on, I don't know, a mainframe in your parents' basement. I think the point is like, you shouldn't have to care. Um, so exactly. it's really about what part of the problem space you have access to, or even want to have access to. Like if I'm running, if I'm, if I'm teaching, um, a course on rails development and I have a bunch of students that are running their app on Heroku, I don't care and they shouldn't care what Heroku is using under the covers to, to make that possible for them to enable them to do that. Um, if I'm a site reliability engineer at Heroku, obviously I have a different opinion about it. Um, I think it's just really all about what's relevant to you. What are you trying to accomplish? What's the right match mm-hmm. for what you're trying to accomplish? Um, and I think it's, it's hard <laughs> or as, a, as a technologist to not get really distracted and kind of focus on what's ahead of you. Um, I'm certainly guilty of it. I like the cool new, new stuff. I get really fixated on like minutia <laughs> of projects and I, I dig really deep into them for my own personal enjoyment. But, um, but I try, you know, it's, it's hard to stay focused, but it is important Um, otherwise it's just, you you know, you feel overwhelmed and then you go into a shame spiral about not using all the the (laughs) stuff that you think you should be using. Well, in the short term though, we know that we can use containers and we can use Docker and we can probably feel free to pick a container orchestrator that makes us happy, Mm -hmm. makes our company happy. And we can always swap it out for another one in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I think the one thing that's really great about the container ecosystem in general is that, you know, generally speaking, and of course there are, are exceptions to this, but pretty much everything that you do has a, an interface that matches another tool. So for example, if you're using Kubernetes and you have a deployment and you have, you know, services that you're declaring, you're exposing a port, you're mounting volumes, all of those things map to something else, like the, the equivalent, the functional equivalent in a different orchestration tool, um, because more or less those tools are solving the same problem. The problem set is pretty well defined. They just have different implementations of the solution. So um, you can move kind of easily back and forth if you if you need to. Um, The same goes um, for for many of the components um, that are are using common interfaces. So swapping out a storage plugin, for example, 
um, networking interface or networking plugins, et cetera. Those things have um, commonly defined interfaces. So the, the vendor lock-in is not so, um, not so scary in the container world. Cool. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to help me uh, get my head around yeah, all I of feel, this because it's overwhelming. I feel sometimes. like we had just like a, a therapy session for everyone who feels overwhelmed by the state of containers. Like we should put some like pseudo music <laughs> behind this whole podcast. Like that is a good idea. Okay. We should call it though. This was, this was container catharsis yeah. is the title yeah, of this show. It's like, it will be okay. <laughs> if you feel overwhelmed, that's fine. Everyone is overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. Um, and I've been, I've been in the container world for five years already. So um, I can just imagine what someone who's starting out must feel like. Um, it's okay. It'll be fine. Cool. Well, people can check you out and your product at cloudbees, B-E-E-S dot com and learn about uh, continuous software and delivery and container, you know, container smarts and DevOps and Jenkins and all those great mm-hmm. things. And uh, they can follow you on Twitter as well. I'll put links in the show notes. Thanks so much for chatting with me today. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Scott. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.